Trumpets, don't don't play to me. Play to that back wall of Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. and let your sound go to that back wall. That doesn't mean you hurt yourself. But you know, that lesson mm -hmm. that he taught, and that's what he was yelling at sound. That mm -hmm. lesson he taught has taught me more now than anything, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how to project not just sound, but how to project love, love. how to project community, yeah. you know. You that's have it. to understand it right. before you can project it, you know. I don't know that I've met more humble, more sweet musicians than Terrell Stafford and Dick Oates. They shared with me their hearts, their inspirations, their missions uh, in life and music. And I learned so much and I hope that you have these same takeaways that I did of their, their gratitude and their humility and their playfulness and curiosity and dedication to being great. It's been an incredible inspiration to me. Here's our podcast. So I'm here with uh, two of my musical heroes. Uh, we're harmonizing together here. Terrell Stafford, welcome. Thank you. Great to be and here. And Dick Oates, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we we were just sitting at lunch, and, and I'm just going to open up with uh, a question we were just, we were kind of getting into a little bit. And I think that the two of you are an immense inspiration to a lot of young players and as players and educators, and, and they see what you're doing and what you're able to handle on in any given year, and it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. You know, the traveling, a lot of coordination, a lot of balancing of life. And so I always wonder, what is the motor <laughs> that, that people are operating with? What, is, what creates that level of dedication? What creates that level of attention to detail to get up early in the morning, to get up early to get to the airport, to create discipline in, in practice routines, to create discipline in just life routines, and to balance out life. Uh, there has to be a mission to it, I, I find, with, with most people. And so I would love to just open up that as a general discussion point to begin with. Sure. <laughs> um, well, I think things have changed for me a lot. You know, I've, I've always been a, a really... Uh, disciplined person because my father, he was in the military. So, you know, watching him growing up, you know, mm. getting up every morning at, you know, 4.30 to go for, a, you know, a five mile run and coming back and going to work and always been very routine oriented. And and from being really young, he'd always ask me, um, what are your goals? It's been always his question for me, always since I can remember since I've been about eight, eight or nine, like, I want your goals for the year. I want your two year goals. And so now, consequently, I find myself very goal oriented. Mm. You know, I write everything down. I put it in, you know, put things down in, in, my, in my phone. And 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 so, my motivation now is different from six years ago because now I have a child. Mm. So my purpose and my motor and and everything that happens in my life now revolves around that. I feel like now I have a purpose. Before, I think I was just spinning my wheels. But you know, I get up early every day. Um, hopefully to work out, but if if not to work out, to always do a maintenance routine. You know, mm. I have three routines that I do: maintenance, growth, and exploration. And uh, I make sure that I, each routine feeds one another, and those routines inspire me to uh, to get better. It, it holds me accountable. Each routine. Wow. Yeah. So, so what, what were those three things again? And so, can you give us so, give us so maintenance? My maintenance routine, as I call it, maintenance because. Um, when I first started to study with Professor Fielder at Rutgers, uh, his 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 comment to me was like, you know, there's a there's a New York, there's a New York level, you know, and you have to maintain mm. to that New York standard, you know, and so my maintenance routine has been in my mind for me to maintain that quote unquote New York standard. 
Um, and then, you know, you ask people, you know, hey, John, can I get a lesson? And you may say, oh, come on, man, you know. So th then I, I created this growth routine because when I'd ask people for lessons, they'd say, oh, you don't need a lesson, but I, I would have questions about things. So my growth routine keeps me accountable. And anything I do in my maintenance routine, you know, from breathing to articulation, then anything that didn't go so great, then I focus that on my growth routine. Mm. And then I always, you know, my, my exploration routine is like dessert. You know, I, I got to get through my steak and potatoes before I get to dessert. And then when I get to that exploration routine, that's when I can cr be more creative, you know, learning a tune or writing a tune or et cetera, et cetera. So that in itself keeps me motivated every day. You know, I can't wait. I love to practice. I can't wait to get to the trumpet. Um, and then when I travel and I get little sleep, you know, I, I look at my daughter and I'm like, this is why I do what I do. And then on Monday nights is is my true inspiration because when I go to the Village Vanguard, I, I when I walk in the door, I get the same butterflies I did 20 years ago before I joined the Vanguard. I get butterflies. I get nervous. And I hear Dick Oates play and I hear Richie Perry play and I hear Scott Winhold play. And, and, you know, I'm like, wow, this is the standard that I have to live by. And if I don't do these routines, then I won't be in this band, you know, so... That helps a lot too to be around great musicians mm -hmm. and to hear that week after week. That's it's really inspiring. So that's I, I don't want to talk, I don't want to hog everything, but mm -hmm. but that's kind of what keeps me driving and it motivates me to 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 do, be better. Awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had a father too that was pretty organized and he was a mm -hmm. great teacher and he gave me my first start. And he uh had a lot of discipline to keep four kids. Uh, he had four kids, and he he uh, after he got out of the service, he he uh, went right into trying to get his degree, and that all kind of started. And he started at a very small Quaker community, and and outside Des Moines, Iowa, maybe about 30, 40 miles, and just to see his inspiration every day, getting up and teaching, and Always uh, giving the students as much as he could give uh, was was a great thing for me to see at an early age, because I used to go to all of his rehearsals, uh, and I used to see how he uh, was up all night the night before preparing, and then how he would get him to swing and how he would get him to, you know, uh, to follow their dreams and. Though at that particular time in the mid '50s, they didn't really know what they were getting into, <laughs> but uh, he was just kind of like a a real Pied Piper, very enthusiastic, and it made me uh, think that, well, if uh, if he can do that, that's that's the kind of inspiration I want to give mm -hmm. to no matter where I go, and to what I commit to, because I think that uh, he really valued the term commitment. And uh, it was not just to his family, but to uh, everyone that even asked for it, even that there was interested. He just was uh, couldn't wait to share information. And I, I think that uh, then, you know, like, like Tara, I'm, I've have four children. And, uh, and I remember I started back in the early 80s. And uh, and each one of them, I mean, they, everybody always says, well, how'd you have a jazz career with, with, with four kids? I said, well, I wouldn't have had a jazz career without that kind of commitment. <laughs> mm. So that really encouraged yeah. me to, to uh, uh, step up my ability to commit and really commit, not just go halfway, but to really, you know, be responsible. And I think that, is probably, if I think about it, that's what's given me the inertia to carry on and to go through as many years as I've done this. Mm -hmm. So I really think that family is so important, and especially like in what Terrell was saying about the jazz family we have at the Vanguard and what we have at Temple and what we have uh, in our friendships and how much we respect it. people in all over Europe, where we go, and it's just like at 
never tires for me. It's always like, wow, I get to see this guy. I get to play with him again. I get, you know, it's like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm going down. So I think that that's the thing that keeps us going or me going is just the constant inspiration I can get from a rehearsal with you and Terrell and this morning with that band, those great young reed players. I'm going like, okay. Yeah. And and I saw it. And, w- and what I'm getting from both of you is this. It kind of gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. It's it's this true, genuine humility, and this true, genuine integrity as they go together. You know that that creates this. That's in, that's in both of you. And what I what I saw with you, Dick, after the rehearsal today, with the uh, with the Frost Concert Jazz Band. All the all the saxophone students were standing up, and they couldn't wait to just just kind of rub shoulders with you for a moment, and and the way that you approached that that energy in that moment was so humble. You you came up and you were just, oh. hey, you know, this it sounds great, and and I you know I, I you know it, it was just the energy that you approached it with, and then they started asking you questions about how to how to improve and you were so giving and that it's that sense of when you were talking about your father that sense of service right. you know it's 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 to give you know it's really to give and with no expectation of any return but then of course you you can't cheat the universe and it just goes right back to you times times 100 <laughs> but that's what i saw when i saw that as okay this is this is humility and this person is here for service yeah well they give me I, I always tell my students, I said, your, your first job is to give me an early retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, I can go away with some dignity. <laughs> right on. So, yeah. And, and I, I was thinking about what you said, too, just about, you know, routine, right? I mean, it's, it's a, there, there are two things. There's the routine and, and, and also surrounding yourself with people that inspire you. Because I think that... Um, that's so much of it. It's like it's like entrainment, you know. When when all the metronomes they they start to follow each other. When mm-hmm. you have a bunch of analog mm-hmm. or clocks, mm-hmm, and yeah. they all start beating at the same time, you start to to be at the same resonance. And they're like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> and so you, when you're with a lot of people that are that are at that highest level or that point zero 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 one percent of the craft, you got to rise up, you know. And yeah. and the way the way that you were both talking about it is like almost like that. Uh, that giddiness of, of a child, like it's it's like I can't wait to be there and be in that, you know. That's that's the spirit which makes the world go round. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, you know, I, you know, Dick Oates has been playing in the Vanguard band for almost forty years, or is it past forty? Forty six years. Forty six years. Huh. And you know, um, we were talking, we were having a conversation last night about you know sometimes you play music and and you have a lot of fun and. Then, because of life and you play with, you know, certain scenarios and drama that goes on, you play music and it's not so much fun. But for for the 20 years that I've been in the Vanguard band, it's just amazing how we can play the same song, you know, so many times and it's still not good enough. Mm. You know, like I just, I want to play, I want to play Fingers once, you know, as an etude and never miss a note, you know, but... <laughs> But I would never do that, you know. There's some things in life that are work in progress, and and yeah, I've been in the band 20 years, and my goal is to to make it through that, to be able to play it in front of an audience by myself at the temple that is called perfectly, <laughs> and that's my goal. And so maybe it's going to take me another 20 years to get to that point, you know. But it's so, I mean, it's it's really inspiring to play music. And I remember when I when I joined when I was asked to join the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, I, my initial response was no. And so my mom was a reading specialist. And so I, I called my mom and I said, you know, Vanguard guys from the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra call and they want me to join the band. And she goes, oh, that's great. And she plays trumpet as well. And she goes, well, what did you say? I said, I said, no. She goes, why'd you say no? I said, mom, I'm dyslexic. I can't go in there every week and play that music. They're going to know I can't read. Wow. You know, and she goes, you can read, but the more you read, the better your eyes will get. So mm-hmm. why don't you say yes and watch what happens? So, you know, I thought about it and I came back and I said, yes. And it's great, you know, because, yeah, with this disease, you know, it affects your reading. But doing it every Monday night or doing it three or four days a week, 
you know, it, it, it gives you the confidence that, you know, as a young person, I didn't have, you know, being so many grade levels behind everybody reading wise and, you know, having the struggle. So it's a healing thing as mm -hmm. well. You know, yeah, it motivates, it motivates me to play and be better, but it soothes my soul because, you know, each week I'm accepted by Dick Oates or Richie Perry. And, you know, I'm reading next to Nick Marchione who never makes mistakes, you know, this, and, and he memorizes after second reading, you know, his, that kind of mind, you know, and, and so it's, it's humbling um, in a way, but it's inspiring in a way. And, and it, it just makes me want to be better and better and better. And so. I first heard him with, uh, they called me to sub on Bobby Watson's band, big band yeah. at the Vanguard. I was so inspired. I was so moved. But the thing that I was sitting in the sax, I was reading this music. And then all of a sudden I heard this trumpet sound, this trumpet player in the back. <laughs> And usually, you know, read players, it's not cool to look around and who's in the band? <laughs> but I, he was the guy that drew me out. I went, who in the hell is this? And it was such an amazing feeling. It was mm -hmm. like, this is what we live for, is that inspiration. And I, it's a continuing thing. We get it from either musicians like on that caliber, or I get it from my kids, or I get it from other teachers that I... I listen to and I want to learn from. It's just this life is a constant source of, of inspiration and learning if you let it. Hmm. Or it can be, it can really eat you up if you let it. So hmm. I prefer the positive. <laughs> well, the you know, on, on that note too, yeah. if you could recall one or two instances in your lives where a specific challenge really benefited you. It really helped you overcome that resistance propelled you into the next place. Yeah. Can you think of any times in your life where that- it, it has to be musical or- no, no, no. I mean, it's all, I mean, I view it all the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know why this pops to my mind, but, um, you know, after I finished my undergraduate degree in trumpet, I play off to the center. So my, my trumpet teacher, um, pretty much said, well, you know, if you don't play in the center, you won't be able to play past the age of 25. So after my undergraduate degree, I quit trumpet. And what, uh, mean what? Yeah, I quit. I became, I got a minor in math and I got a minor in computer science. So I, I didn't know this. Yeah. So I, be, uh, I was a <laughs> computer programmer for an insurance company and I tutored in trigonometry at, at my alma mater. And, and, you know, I, I go to hear this, <clears throat> my, my, uh, my friends were like, come on, man, you got to play. Anyway, they took me to go hear Wynton Marcellus, and he was playing with the Eastman Wind Ensemble, and of course, he was amazing. So I meet Wynton, and Wynton's like, you know, he goes, you play trumpet? I'm like, kind of. And I said, he's like, what does kind of mean? So I told him I didn't play off, and, you know, he says, that doesn't matter. Go to my teacher. So long and short of it, I go to Professor Fielder. I, I enroll in graduate school, and, uh, you know, I make it through graduate school, and I take my comprehensive exams. And so all through my life, my mom has always said, you know, I didn't know I had dyslexia when I was younger. So all through my life, she's always said, CEOs of companies always have someone proofread their their papers. So all through undergrad, I did that. All through grad school, I had someone proofread except for my comprehensive exam. Nobody could proofread that. So I take my exam. Mm. I study like crazy and I take the exam. And about three weeks later, they call me and he said, we just want to let you know you failed your exam. You cannot get your master's degree. And my mom was sitting right where Oates is sitting right now. And I said, I failed the exam. Wow. I studied so hard. And they're like, you failed. And my mom says, can I get on the phone for a minute? And so she gets on the phone. She goes, hi, my name is Ruth Stafford. And <clears throat> uh, I would like, is, is there a reading center on campus? And and so they said, yeah. They're, well, can you take it to your reading specialist? And she started going through all this, this gibberish that I'd never heard of. Um, and do this analyzation and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And they said, sure. So they do this. And I'm like, oh, man. So I get off the phone. A day later, they call me back and they're like, you passed with flying colors. Why didn't you tell us you're dyslexic? And I was like, I am? Mom, why didn't you tell me? She goes, because you'd use it as a crutch. And so when I got that degree, it just, it inspired me. Like, we can do anything we put our mind to with other people, you know, as teams, we I've, the people that were proofreading my paper didn't know me, but they were investing in me. And so that moment, 
made me really believe in humanity. Like we can accomplish anything we want, not always by ourselves, but if mm. we believe in others mm. and other and we can trust, others can help pull us through anything. So that's really true. Well, first takeaway is moms. Yes. Moms <laughs> are the best. The best. They know things. They know things that nobody else knows. And 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 talk about that that service, like even from the from the father role, but but moms, like it's so unconditional. Yeah. It's just it's just full of love. <laughs> you know, and, and whatever's gonna gonna make you thrive, that's what they're gonna do mm-hmm. to the death. Yep. Moms. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I remember I I caught the Duke Ellington Count Basie joint concerts in 1962 in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, I, I knew that Basie was there and I knew that Ellington, but I only wanted two autographs, and that was Duke Ellington and Johnny Hodges. But they were so far away, and so finally I was just waiting, and I saw two guys standing at the bar. <clears throat> And uh, so I, like, I was probably eight years old, and I went up there with a piece of paper and says, "Could you guys sign this?" He says, "Sure, son. What instrument do you play?" He says, "I play the alto saxophone." And he goes, "See, Johnny." And so that was Johnny Hodges, and Duke Ellington. I didn't had no clue, but that inspired me for my entire. That's what gave me, because I was from the podunk middle part of Iowa and there was nothing happening except for that one moment of inspiration. When I saw those guys get on that bus, mm. smell those diesel fumes, I said, that's what I want, man. Really? <laughs> I did. I said, that's what I want to travel with a band like that. I want to talk about music. I want to like learn. Whoa. So, and it's just like, that was the inspiration that lasted years and years. I mean, my father c- continued to be pretty diligent in, 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 to inspire us, take us to several concerts. But it was that moment that I said, that's what I have to do. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm aspiring to do. And so when I got to uh, New York and I went down to the kitchen of the Vanguard and I heard uh, uh, one of the people on this, you know, that I thought was the janitor and he's screaming at me. He says, what do you think you're doing here? I says, oh, I want to play with Thad Jones and Mel Luther. I says, who says? I said, well, Thad Jones says, says, well, what's your name again? I said, Dick Oates. He says, never heard of you. So what makes you think you can come into this band and read this music and play souls and play, do you double? Don't tell me you're just a little bit. I said, yeah, I can double uh, a little. He says, you keep saying a little. Either you can play or you can't. So when I told him, I said, uh, no, I think, <clears throat> I said, what do you mean you think? He just wasn't used to hearing it. So finally Thad Jones came in and said, uh, you're Dick Oates, right? He said, yeah. He says, well, this is Mel Lewis you're talking to. So that really like changed my whole framework. I'm glad I didn't say anything mean or mm-hmm. harsh or you know, derogatory or anything like that might have been, but uh, that is that that was a true test for me, <laughs> knowing that uh, I wasn't going to go uh, get defensive or anything like that. Because mm. it's a lot of times when you move or you go to a bigger city, and I'm sure Terrell's got some plenty of stories. But you know, it's about how committed are you? Are you just you know, mm. is it just a little bit or you know, what is it? Yeah. You know, they want to know just how much love you have the same love they have. And and so that brought a whole nother meaning to me. I was going, Wow, I didn't know it was this heavy. Mm-hmm. And then I just kept going, oh, I gotta get more, I gotta get more. I gotta keep growing and maturing. So you know that it makes me think about, you know, sometimes I, I tell uh and bands that I'm working with, we're going to go out and play. And I'll say, you know, right, that there's going to be a six-year-old kid out there. And they're going to see that big baritone saxophone. And then they're going to go, what is that? And 
that's what I want to do, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, or, or the alto saxophone. It's like, and, and that was the next Dick Oates, you know, and that's you're right. the reason why they, they were given that inspiration to go after it, you know, so, so go at it with that kind of responsibility. Well, Hodges was most my reason. <laughs> and Duke Ellington, I was just like, oh, I, I, it was an un- unbelievable spiritual kind of experience. Mm. Tell, tell me about that. The people that, they were like movie stars to me because mm. I used to listen to them so much with my father. And that was the camaraderie that most of us musicians have. When you say to yeah, you is yeah. that we listen to the same thing, we, we have the same passions. It's a, it's a family of uh, shared experiences that we all can say we love, mm. you know. Terrell, who who are your your heroes, your big heroes, and and did you ever get to meet them and hang with them? Kind of, yeah. So um, we moved from Miami to Chicago. Yeah, welcome and, home, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> nice to be home. I brought the weather. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you know, I, I really wanted to uh, really wanted to play trumpet. I've always wanted to play trumpet because my cousin played trumpet, and I played a stringed instrument. That's a whole other thing to get into, but. <clears throat> when I was able to play trumpet, my mom took me um, to Chicago Symphony to hear Bud Herseth play. And, you know, wow. we're sitting in, in, in Symphony Hall and Mr. Herseth's playing. <clears throat> and so first of all, he comes out on stage and everyone's playing, but not him. And I was like, Mom, what's wrong? Is he sick? And she goes, no, just just chill, you know. And so, you know, he didn't. he doesn't warm up. He always does the same thing. He comes, sits on stage and puts his horn on his knee. And then when conductor comes out, he lifts up in horn, and what came out was just so beautiful and just so moving. And so, like, I remember, like, it was yesterday, they played Tchaikovsky 4, and bum, da da dum bum, bum. And so I was listening. And so every time he'd play, my mom would lean over, and she goes, that's the standard, son. That's the standard. Mm. Play again. That's the standard. So, like, in my mind, she's ingraining, like, mm. this is, because I, I, I didn't want to, when I was younger, I didn't like jazz. I just wanted to play in Chicago Symphony, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so long and the short of it, I uh, make it through my undergrad, um, my first year of graduate school, and I'm studying with Professor Fielder. And I was working on this um, piece called Let the Bright Seraphim, you know, handle piece. And um, <clears throat> the vocalist would improvise. She wouldn't sing it like it was written. And she'd throw in ornaments that weren't on the mu- wasn't in the music. And I couldn't play the ornaments because I wasn't used to it. So Professor Field was like, anything you prepare for, you know, you know, practice in that key, you know, and, and pl- play every kind of shape you can in that key. So when you sing with her, you'll be ready. And so this is how I started really to, to learn about improvisation uh, by, by playing, getting ready for this recital. So right after that, I played the recital and he was really happy with how I played the recital. And he goes, I'm really proud of you. Um, tomorrow, I want you to pick me up. Wear a shirt and a tie, jacket. We're going into Manhattan. I said, what are we going to do? So he's like, stop asking so many questions. So I pick him up. We go into Manhattan. We go to Carnegie Hall. I park the car. And I said, what are we going to do here at Carnegie Hall? He goes, stop asking questions. And, <laughs> and on the front of Carnegie Hall, Chicago Symphony. They're playing Tchaikovsky number four. He remembered. I told him wow. this was like, and so I was like, prof. Thank you so much. He goes, well, you did a good job on that recital. This is just, so we're sitting there. Mr. Hurtness comes out. <laughs> dum, da, 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 dum, boom. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much, Prof. So after it was over, he said, are you hungry? So we went across the street to this, red, it's called the Red Bull Diner. Um, so we go across the street to have a bite to eat and Prof and I are talking. And and after a few minutes of talking, Bud Herseth comes through the door and sits next to me. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Prof, do you know him? And Prof goes, that's my teacher. I was like, you never told me that. He goes, you never asked. You asked the wrong questions, you know? So I'm sitting next to Bud Herseth. And I'm like, Mr. Herseth, last time I heard you play, this was when I was 13. And, you know, it was so emotional. I feel the emotion now. Mm. And I said, your playing is so inspiring. I said, I want to be just like you. I said, one day I want to sit next to you in the Chicago Symphony. You're the world's greatest trumpet player. And he goes, no, I'm not. I'm not the world's greatest trumpet player. And so that goes on to another story. But I got to sit next to Bud Herseth. And uh, he, you know, he told me things like, he goes, uh, he goes, son, do you wake up every morning and yawn? I said, yes. He goes, that's how it should be playing the trumpet. If trumpet is not a yawn, you're doing something wrong. 
And he goes, before I leave, just remember this. Strength equals weakness. Weakness equals strength. He goes, figure that out. And so he was giving, dropping all this knowledge to me, you know, and, and then he, you know, he went back to his hotel, but it was just like meeting Bud Herseth and hearing his words of encouragement, his words of wisdom, it just uplifted me, you know, and to this day, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the inspiration. And, and to, to jump even further. So when Professor Fielder got really sick, he was in hospice. And uh, <clears throat> so Professor Fielder says, I gave a few people your number. And they're going to call you to check on me. So I'm sitting in, in like a restaurant and all of a sudden my phone rings. I'm like, S -s excuse me. It's, Hello. Hi, Terrell. This is uh, Bud Herseth. And I'm calling to check on Professor Field. I'm like, ah! <laughs> so then I entered his name on my phone. He would call me like three times a week. And if I were around trumpet players, I'm like, excuse me, guys. And I show the phone. It would be like Bud Herseth. And he's like, you have Bud Herseth's number. <laughs> oh, my. So like three times a week, you know, up until he passed, Mr. Herseth would call me. Just to check on it was just like just crazy. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. So, incredible. so what did you figure out with so, weakness and strength? So his thing, Mr. Hurst's thing, uh, whole premise, you know, from Jacobs, all the Jacob stuff is that if you play from tightness, if you play from, you know, strength mm. here, it makes this weak. Uh -huh. If you play from strength here and loose and pliable here, then this can respond to the air, and when the corners respond to the air, that's what activates the corners and gives you strength. Mm. So that's what that statement. And then if you look on, I have this Arnold Jacobs, like cheat sheet. And the very first sentence on this sheet I have says the exact strength equals weakness, weakness equals strength. It talks about palpitating, palpitating gets you away from the strength thing. It's just, mm. it's, it's really, it's really brilliant. Yeah. I see. Hmm. Yeah. It's a great story. The Clark Terry story. <laughs> Yeah, that that's a that came from the Clark Terry story, yeah, but I, I don't want to. Yeah. <clears throat> well, come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at the same dinner, when Mr. Herthus, when I said to him, "You're the world's greatest trumpet player," he says, "I'm not the world's greatest trumpet player." When I was in the Navy, he said, um, "I sat next to the world's greatest trumpet player. Mm. I played principal in the concert band. He played principal in the concert band. In the jazz band, he played lead, and I played lead." But he improvised, and I didn't. So let that be a lesson. Make sure you're as well-rounded as possible, and you learn how to improvise. And I said, well, who's this, who's this trumpet player? He goes, his name is Clark Terry. <clears throat> and he goes, if you see Clark Terry, his name anywhere, go find him and, and, and hear him and meet him. So I did. You know, Some years later, you know, I took Mr. Hertz's advice, and I started to learn how to improvise when I was 23. I was almost done with my master's. And so I was going to this jam session and learn how to improvise. And, <clears throat> and everybody would call me Haydn because I didn't know how to swing. So they, that was their nickname for me. They'd be like, oh, here comes Haydn. He can't swing. And I'd be like, hey, how you guys doing? You know. <clears throat> so I was like on this quest to figure out how do you swing? Like, and so um, I see Clark Terry's name at this Cape May Jazz Festival. And I go to the Cape May Jazz Festival. And uh, before, I got my tickets and I go to this diner. And Mr. Terry was in the back of the diner. So I said, Mr. Terry, you don't know me but uh, I play trumpet and I'm coming to hear you tonight. And he goes, sit down, baby boy, sit down. So mm -hmm. I sit down. I said, I have a message for you from um, Mr. Bud Herseth. He told me to tell you that you're the world's greatest trumpet player. He goes, Bud Herseth, he lies. He's the world's greatest <laughs> trumpet player. And so he says, what do you do, son? And I said, well, I'm finished up my master's degree in classical trumpet. And he goes, oh, classical guy. I said, yeah, but I want to learn how to play jazz, but I can't swing. They at this club I play and they call me Haydn because I can't swing. And he thought that was so funny. He's laughing, laughing. He goes, baby boy, I can teach you how to swing in two minutes. I said, please. He said, say doodle. I said, doodle. He said, say it over, D over and over. I said, doodle, 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 doodle. He goes, you just learned how to play the perfect eighth note. Mm -hmm. And now he says, say doodle. I said, doodle. He goes, put accent on la. I said, doodle, doodle, doodle. He goes, now you just learned how to play everything else. He goes, now you can swing. <laughs> everything you play. Every note you play, let it come from dude line. I was like, That's... the angels were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> great. That I, is fantastic. I hear them now. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, yeah, crazy. I used to, uh, I did a couple of uh, camps, j summer jazz camps mm -hmm. that, that was it. They were in, in Clark's name mm. in Oklahoma. Wow. And, uh, and we spent the week there with him. And, the, and he, they would play a noon concert, you know, every day and got to hear him play every day and he was really with us and so giving and and all of that 
And, you know, my, my, my story was like a tough love story with him because mm. I remember like the culminating concert, one of those, one of those concerts, we played with the big band and he was up there, <laughs> up there conducting. I played a solo and I was feeling pretty good about my solo. It's like, and I just played for Clark Terry and it sounded pretty good. It's like, that's all right. <laughs> and then I, and then I made that slow walk, you know, back to the trumpet section in the back. He, he was back there waiting for me. And he said, John, if I ever see you playing with your, your knuckles on, on the valves like that, I'm going to cut them off. <laughs> and then, and then I got about a foot shorter. I said, yes, Mr. Terry. Thank oh, you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, that's Amazing. great. Wow. Amazing. He was one of the funniest people. <clears throat> oh. But he inspired to me. That was such an inspiration. How many people he inspired from all walks of life. Yeah. Oh, we brought him out to my little hometown in Iowa in 1967 or 66. And it was just like he did the Swedish cook, the whole. Mm. Oh, <laughs> That was that's the stuff that keeps yeah. you going. Yeah. I think that's the model to me. He was the model. Now, and, and all all of these mentors, uh, you know, and and we all have so many that come into our lives mm -hmm. at the perfect time, and maybe they come in at the perfect time and we don't even see them sometimes, mm -hmm. and so, and then we come back, you know, and <clears throat> when life cycles back, and you know, both of you are such dedicated uh, educators yourself, and. I'm I'm curious, and you've been doing it a long time. We've all been doing it a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious uh, if you see what any differences in the generations now uh, that that come to you. Do you see different qualities coming from from the students now? Different things that they need to work on that other generations didn't have to work on, and that you know different strengths and challenges for the over the generations. And and really, what do you see for the students now? What are what are they having to overcome? I'm more seeing what I have to work on after I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. Oh goodness. Yes. True. I think <laughs> the, the uh, it's gotten so much incredible. I mean, there's so much talent out there, and I can't wait for them to make their mark. I've I'm so inspired by them, mm. you know, I, 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 by not just their excellent playing, but their dedication to what we dedicated our lives to. They really, to me, this young generation to me is like, wow, I'm hook, line and sinker for them. Mm. I, I, I'm really like inspired by them. Mm. So, but there's a lot of uh, hoops that you got to go through and it's how you can sustain strength and inspiration, love, passion, and not let some of those other things deter you from your mission is, is to uh, show love mm -hmm. and to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, play to the top of your ability. If you can, I mean, I, I think inspiration comes from so many different places. And so like, uh, I get inspiration every time I hear Terrell or somebody at, at the Temple faculty. I'm getting inspiration from what we just did this morning. I mean, it's constant. If you just open up your eyes and see it, mm -hmm. it's all out there every day, every second. I get inspired when I take the train into Temple just to see how these people are so dedicated, bringing food home to their families or dedicated father. On the, you know, it's just there's inspiration everywhere you look. So just always look positive. And I think that's what these students are starting to really mm. be a great example of to me. Receive and show love. Mm. You know, and, and that's, uh, if you won't mind me saying, that's exactly how you play. Mm. That's exactly how you play. And that's exactly the feeling that I have when you play. Mm. It's this, this being knows how to receive and show love. Yeah. Well, that's because I was given love. Mm. Tara was given love. I mean, that's, mm. that's the... Uh, that's the ultimate goal, I think, mm -hmm. is just to keep love always in the game. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not just a business. We're a, we're truly a family. Mm -hmm. so, you know, all to, of us today. Um, I mean, I, I I'll answer a question, but you know, we travel around to a lot of we play with a lot of college bands and yeah. even a lot of professional bands. But like today, you know, the thing 
that I walk away with uh, that, you know, I won't forget is after we played, the trumpet players all came up, which is very rare, first mm. of all. <clears throat> you know, all the trumpet players came up and, you know, we're all thankful, thank you know, you know, telling each other how great we sound. And they were like, hey, if you're not doing anything, we're going to go to some, you know, to this place. And I was like, you know what? I said, I would love to go. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be going to hang out with John and Oates. And, you know, in my mind, I said, you know, what's being taught in the spirit that, that's being, you know, shared with the students from you is, is exactly what's needed. Because, you know, I would hope my students would come up to a guest artist and say, hey, if you're not busy, would you want to come hang out? Because that means a lot. That, that means that the love and the spirit and the joy hmm. that, what, that we received is being passed on. So you may not always see it, but I'm, I just have to let you know that, you know, when I said to you today, you know, I said, thank you for what you're doing. That was part of my thanks, because if there were more people like you that, that led bands, that, that shared community and shared love, and you go through ups and you go through downs, just like you do in a great relationship, you know, um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's community. So you're, you're creating that. So bravo. And, and, and that's mm. really inspiring to see. Um, as far as what I've seen with um, students and the differences, one thing that I haven't seen a difference in um, really um, is like, as far as like trumpeters is concerned, is like um, when I started 26 years ago at Temple, we were talking about fundamentals with a lot of players. And 26 years later, we talk about the same fundamentals. And so there hasn't been like uh, an exceptional, exceptional, leap in fundamentals with <laughs> trumpet players it just hasn't mm. it's it's something that you know now i hear better improvisers mm. that can't play the trumpet as well mm. before there were not as good improvisers that still couldn't play the trumpet that well but once they got the trumpet then the improvisation kicked in mm. and so now the challenge is like we live in this info and i'm not dogging my students because they're great we live in this information age where they have access to everything. You want to learn a tune? You can find a lead sheet here. You can find a recording here. You can find 20 recordings on YouTube. So the information is there, but the work you have to put in that we both know on trumpet is extra work. I mean, I'm not saying the saxophone is not difficult, it is. but, but, um, you know, the, I feel the trumpet is a humbling thing. If you don't put the work into it, it will embarrass you. Like you've never been embarrassed before, you know? So, um, so that that fundamental thing hasn't changed. Just getting people mm -hmm. to, you know, to 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 pre to know that yeah, you can take a great solo, improvise solo, but you know, make sure you can play through a few Charlier and a few characteristic study, and make sure you can play the H's, the you know, Hyde and Hummel Hindemith. Make sure that's part of your repertoire too, because that's playing the trumpet, and that's something that's not consistently not being addressed. And you know, mm -hmm. I talk to Winton about it like all the time. Like mm -hmm. he, he talks about. Where's the core to people's sound? People, you get the core from these fundamentals. So I, I would love to see that, you know, for, even from my teaching, mm. more consistent and, and addressed more. But I think now, man, the, the, the level of improvisation is off the chain. It may not be like the improvisation, you know, playing, you know, three is one or, or playing, you know, Big Dipper. But, you know, it, it may be like improvising over odd meters i'm in just in awe of how these how they can just weave in and out time wise and i'm just like oh my gosh so that has like evolved to a level that i've never seen mm -hmm. before i mean we have a couple students this one in particular i mean nothing's difficult for him mm -hmm. you know and it's just that's inspirational you know i bring in charge i'm like here why don't you play this <laughs> okay why don't you play this <laughs> you know everything is like that and it's like okay let me go home <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, oh so, so all too well. So humbling, you know. So, so I, you know, all to say is that you know some things have changed, some haven't. But yeah. man, the level is yeah. incredible, and the teaching and the the sharing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love being around your students because there's humility to your students. No matter how great they play, they they're a mirror of who you are. Yeah. And 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 same thing with your students. I was having this conversation with. Uh, with Donald Harrison about Art Blakey. And Donald Harrison said, I said, we were, <clears throat> we were um, finished the sound check and we're just walking around until the gig started. So I said, so Donald, 
was Art Blakey mean? He goes, Art Blakey was a mirror. Mm. I said, what do you mean he was a mirror? He goes, whatever you put out, he gave it back to you. So if someone told you Art Blakey was mean, think about it. (laughs) He goes, so if we're all mirrors, imagine how we can shape and change the people around us. Right. I said, wow. God, that's heavy. Wow. I think that's that's true in a very general way too. You know, we we are all getting back what we put out. Yep. You know, from emotions to uh, situations to the people that we bring into our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's all resonance like that. You know, whatever you're feeling, that's what you're going to see back. <laughs> it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But I appreciate. I really appreciate what you said about community. And, and I also want to give a shout out to the professors here at Frost because Brian Lynch does an incredible job with those uh, jazz trumpet students. Mm-hmm. ATN Charles is here right now. We have some amazing uh, faculty members that, that, are, that, that have that discipline, that have the fundamentals and have the heart, you know, like like John Hart and like uh, yeah. Martin Bejarano and Daphnis Prieto. I mean, they they all create this this place where it's. I think it's if we all can do that, create a place where we we challenge each other just to show what's possible, mm. but we nurture each other mm. and take care of that family together. Mm-hmm. That's right. And then you said it right there. We nurture each other because this is a giving type of music and experience. Mm-hmm. I, I always think that the, the farther you go forward, the farther you got to go backwards to really understand the depth and the meaning of, and that's what, to me, like the Vanguard, that's why I've stayed so many years because I, I didn't have that ability. I had to, I had to stay with until I understood what that meant. Mm. And uh, so thank God I, I've, I've, we both had that experience to be able to carry on and dedicate, hopefully, to our students the same feeling we got from that. You know, you know what I come away from this trio of harmonization today, this triad, uh, is, is the fundamentals on top of the fundamentals. Th- that is gratitude. I hear that f- just so profoundly deep gratitude yeah <laughs> like a real gratitude the real gratitude mm. and and the humility that goes along with that the love you know that and and with all of those things that creates an integrity where you can really really just just be on mission and create that discipline and the routines and all of that and being okay with getting roughed up a little bit <laughs> mm-hmm. you know i mean that's all a part of it to me to to uh, hit hit your lowest of lows sometimes, so you can mm-hmm. learn how to function within that. But to avoid it, I don't think that's so healthy. Yeah. So uh, I think that coming from a like an area that I grew up with, with what five hundred people in the whole hometown, right? Where everybody knew everybody, but for me to be on, you know, twenty years later out in New York, I'm going, like, oh man. This isn't Kansas. You know. It's courageous. Yeah, yeah, but it was like, I'm so glad I did it because it really, not just made me a, uh, made me a better human, understanding everyone, mm. or try at least making the attempt <laughs> mm. to understand. Yeah, so really, I, I, I'll never forget when I met Dick Oates. Um, two things. So, so one was. Bob, I was playing with Bobby Watson and Bobby was going out with someone else for like a week. And so he says, why don't you stay at my house? And I said, okay. So I stayed at his house for the week, you know, and he goes, one thing you got to do is to go to the Vanguard. You got to hear Dick Oates. I want you to sit in the front row, right in front of his bell. You got to feel what comes out of his mm-hmm. bell. So I go to the Vanguard, I sit in the front row, right in front of Oates and Oates plays. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so after the set was over, I jumped up and I ran out. And so... I, I called Bobby. I said, I just heard Dick Oates. He goes, did you talk to him? I said, no, you didn't tell me to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to listen to him. He goes, well, you got to talk to him too. So um, so the next time I saw 
to go. It was in the Carnegie Hall band. And uh, and John Faddis was leading the band, and I was subbing for Randy Brecker in the band. And, uh, you know, Faddis was just yelling, everybody. And so, you know, like, like I'm looking at the tax phone section, like, Dick Oates and Frank West and Jimmy Heath and Gary Somali. Like, oh, my God. And uh, uh, no, Ralph Lallama, uh No, it was Ralph Lallama and and Frank West. Yeah, and Somalian. Me. Yeah, and Somalian. And, uh, and so Oates did something, and Faddis was like, Oates, blah, 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 blah. Don't you bring that Vanguard stuff here. And I'm looking at Faddis like, you can't yell at him. That's Dick Oates. You know, that's what I'm thinking in my mind. So, you know, at the rehearsal, I go down and I'm like, hi, Mr. Oates, how you doing? He's like, hey, how you doing? Just the sweetest person ever. <laughs> and, then, and I think about it now, like Frank West was super sweet and, and blah, blah, you know, all the guys in the band were sweet. And when I tell students about, you know, meeting Dick Oates and, and how Faddis is yelling at all of us, I'm like, I was upset that Faddis, mm. but tough love, you know, mm. But you know what, what, what we yelled about? He yelled about one of the things he yelled about was our sound, like projecting mm. sound. And he would always, he would always, um, he'd always say to the trumpets, he goes, "You know, trumpets, don't don't play to me, play to that back wall, of Carnegie Hall, mm. and let your sound go to that back wall. That doesn't mean you hurt yourself." But you know that lesson mm. that he taught, and that's what he was yelling at for sound. That mm. lesson he taught has taught me more now than anything. You know mm. uh, how to project. Not just sound, but how to project love, love. how to project community, yeah. you know? You That's have it. to understand it right. before you can project it, you know? And there right. was, and even though there was tough love, there was a lot of community that happened right. then. But it's just, it was just so great to see that, you know, no matter what pedestal you're on, yeah. we, we, all are, we all have to learn. Yeah. We're all in this place of being vulnerable. And, and, yeah. One yeah. of my best examples was Jerry Dodgen. Mm. And that was like, oh. That was the best, you know, because he's he's exactly what I wanted to mm. be and exude mm. that love, and he was just incredible. Yeah. And you got to care enough sometimes to 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 prod it, yep. you know. Yep. To do it. Yep. Um, I want to thank you both for sitting down with me today. I really appreciate it, and I know the listeners are gonna gain a lot from. From your hearts. Yeah. So, thank you, John. So thank Thanks you for all so you much. Do for bringing us together. and yeah. Especially, yeah. And you contributed so much music. <laughs> yeah, your writing and your talent. I remember this last, this one tune that I played, uh, that I think uh, Clark Terry had called All Heart. Mm. Mm. Oh, and that's perfectly was him. All heart. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. a great tune. Yeah, great tune. Yeah. All right. All right Thank you, Tail Stafford. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Dick Oates. Thanks. I'll see you, you at John the concert Rissa. tonight. Yep. Yeah, you will. <laughs> All right. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Much gratitude, everyone, for checking out the podcast. Please just subscribe and follow and like and add a comment as it really helps us expand and grow uh, and keep us all connected together. So I appreciate it very much, and I send you much, much, much love. I'll see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.